Okay, let's get rolling today. I am. I wanted to thank you all for joining the Endoscopy Now virtual education event called Strategies to Eliminate ERCP-Related Infections, a People, Process, and Product Approach to Mitigate Risk. I am Patrick Hurley, Director of Marketing for GI at AMBU. I will be your moderator for today's event, and this presentation is being recorded in its entirety and will replay. Uh, the replay will be available on Endoscopy and Now app in just a few days. During the event, if you have any questions, please submit those through the Q&A tab on your Zoom council at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. And if you're viewing the event on a mobile device and having to lose your connection, please reopen your app and access the event by clicking the attend button. Today's event offers CE, uh, a CE to nurses and we'll explain how to obtain your certification at the completion at the end of the webinar. I'm gonna read this slide uh, as well. So nursing professionals, Terry Goodman and Associates is an approved provider of continuing nursing education by the New Mexico Nurses Association Approver, an accredited approver by the American Nurses Crediting Center's Commission on Accreditation. This activity provides 1.0 contact hours. You must attend at least 85% of this activity and complete the evaluation within 30 days to receive a CE certificate. And you will receive your CE certificate or CE evaluation within five business days. Other healthcare providers, Certific cert um, certificate of completion available to all participants that are not using, uh, that are not nursing professionals available in the downloads. For CE assistance, please contact this email below. So we are pleased to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Hudson Garrett and Corey Ofsted. Dr. Garrett is the president and CEO of Community Health Associates LLC and has a faculty appointment as an adjunct assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He's also the co-founder of a nonprofit infection prevention institute to help shepherd dissemination of best practices of infection prevention and across the uh, co control across the healthcare continuum of global um, care globally. He holds a graduate uh, certificate in infection prevention and infection control from the University of South Florida, and he's completed the Johns Hopkins Fellows Program in Hospital Epidemiology and Infection Control. He has served on expert panels related to disinfection and sterilization in the, in the United States Food Centers and for disease control and prevention and Drug Administration and Environmental Protection Agency, most notably serving on the FDA's panel and working group for flexible endoscope reprocessing. Dr. Garrett has lectured in more than 25 countries and given testimony to government and regulatory agencies on a variety of topics related to infection control. Corey Ofsted is an epidemiologist with 30 years of experience designing and conducting real world studies to evaluate the impact of medical care on outcomes. She's the founder and CEO of Ofsted and Associates, where she oversees a multidisciplinary team based in Minnesota. She has served as the principal investigator on studies related to infection prevention, vaccination, and instrument reprocessing, and a co-investigator on diabetes and disease management studies. Corey's a frequent speaker at events sponsored by ARN, APIC, ISHM, SGNA, ASGE, AGA, AMI, CDC, and the FDA, and is a contributing author to ISHM's endoscope reprocessing textbook and has served as a subject matter expert for ARN's endoscopic reprocessing guidelines. She's also a voting member of Amy's Working Group 84. Um, here are the disclosures for tonight's speakers, as you see. And with that, I want to welcome Dr. Garrett and Corey and thank them for taking the time to speak with us today. I'll, I'll turn it over to you and take it away. Thank you, Patrick. That was a great introduction. And I apologize for the alphabet soup that you had uh, with regard to all of those organizations. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're delighted to be here with you today. And Hudson and I are excited about sharing the information that we've prepared for you. Uh, let me just touch in about what we're going to do with today's uh, time. On the left-hand part of your screen, you can see the navigation for today. So we're going to do four blocks. And the first one's going to start with duodenoscopes, contamination, and infection evidence. And uh, the objectives for today will be to discuss 
the clinical implications of the FDA's 522 studies related to reusable duodenoscopes, and then review the current evidence-based clinical recommendations for infection control related to the use of duodenoscopes. We'll wrap up by discussing a strategic approach to infection control and patient safety for ERCPs that's going to focus on people, process, and products. Let's see if we can get, there we go. Uh, so let's get on the same page just by taking a look at the anatomy of a duodenoscope. And there's an insertion tube that has a distal end and a bending section. We'll be talking a lot about that area of the scope during today's presentation. Uh, and in addition, there's a control handle that includes buttons and knobs that allow the endoscopist to control um, the scope and manipulate the up and down lever of the uh, elevator and the suction and flushing uh, capabilities, et cetera. Instruments are inserted into the patient through the biopsy port or instrument port, and they come out the distal end and we'll show you in a moment what happens with the elevator. Uh, and then of course, there's a universal cord and a light source that plugs into the tower. Now there's been an awful lot of attention on the distal end of ERCP scopes that have this elevator mechanism. And basically, an elevator mechanism is a little piece of metal that uh, can be lifted up or down. And then when the instruments come through the channel, they deflect them. So they come out the side of the distal end rather than shooting straight out of the scope. Um, this is a little videotape that we took in order to show you how that elevator mechanism works. And I'm just going to play it a couple times so you can see how that works. So there's, a, in this case, a braided wire that actually pulls that little piece of metal up and allows it to uh, then, when the instruments come out, hit it and deflect out. Now, as you look at that elevator, you can see that it's a very intricate uh, design in that elevator recess. And there are all kinds of nooks and crannies that make it extremely difficult to clean and it's absolutely essential to clean underneath the elevator and also on top of it. Now, if the techs can get the elevator clean, they also have the issue with that little wire that's used to pull the lever up and down. And in this case, this is a, an open braided wire, but the wire actually goes up inside the elevator channel. And I think may maybe you've heard a lot about problems with the elevator itself and the elevator channel because that braided wire gets soil and uh, bio burden on it. And then it goes up inside the channel, pulling that up in there. And the issue with that elevator channel is that you can't get a brush in there to clean it. So it's cleaned only by uh, taking detergent and flushing it through the elevator channel. Now, Hudson, you're going a little fast for me here. Are you, are you advancing the slides? Cause I think I've nope. lost control. Um, I wonder if it's playing timings. And so it's advancing ahead of where I want to be with the, uh, with the size. So we're having a little technical difficulty and I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to try to take it back one side. Uh, okay. So um, on this side, just a quick, hmm, it's, it's got a life of its own because it's advancing uh, not at the control of me here. So if we let can me, go. Let me try to fix it. Hold on just a minute. Yeah. So if you can bear with us, um, it, probably in the slideshow, it has the timings toggled on in your deck. You can bear with us for just a moment. Uh, I, I will go back to talking about the previous side where we have uh, the elevator recess and channel. And that uh, component has been uh, very difficult to clean, but it's also really difficult to take samples. Uh, and our team has discovered that the concept of doing the cultures that are recommended to uh, perform surveillance, and I'm not sure if you're able to get back to that uh, photo, Hudson, but it'd be cool if, if you could one back from there. There we go. Um, when our team does the sampling of the distal end of ERCP scopes, we've uh, realized that one person can maybe hold the distal end and use a swab to go down along the elevator to get the sample. But then their hands are, are busy. If they're keeping aseptic technique, they can't go up and turn the knob to have the elevator go up and down to do the sampling we have to do under and above 
uh, the elevators. So what ends up happening is we have one person handling that, one person handing things to the person doing the sampling, and then one person actually touching the distal end of the scope. Um, and the, the, so I'm going to try to see if I can get this to advance. Will it, will it do it is the question. There we go. Um, so one of the things we've discovered with sampling ERCP scopes is that if you don't actually get a good sample up under the elevator and on top of the elevator, you'll have false negatives. And, and a problem we've had with the swabs is that a lot of the commercially available swabs used for sampling uh, that's uh, used with microbial cultures are actually too large to fit up under the elevator or in those nooks and crannies, which we have to do if we're going to actually get a good sample. So yay, it's working now. Uh, thanks for bearing with us on the technical issues. But this slide shows examples of outbreaks associated with ERCP. And what I'd like you to do in this table is start by looking at the left-hand columns. And you can see here that just in the last few years, uh, these are samples of outbreaks that have been reported uh, publicly. And they come from regions all over the world. And the pathogens that have been involved in these outbreaks uh, are all different kinds of pathogens, in many cases, multidrug resistant organisms, which come to light because normal antibiotics don't take care of the infections and the patients become gravely ill. Now, one of the things that we've discovered um, in these outbreak investigations is that often numerous patients are actually infected before anyone notices that there's something going on. And, uh, and that's uh, tragic, and unfortunately, we're not preventing that as much as we should. But as an epidemiologist, what we do is we look at the attack rate. And an attack rate is simply a proportion of the patients who are exposed to the risk, in this case, a contaminated duodenoscope, and then what proportion of them actually got infected. Now, as an epidemiologist, we get concerned when we see attack rates uh, or adverse events happening in uh, one in 10,000 patients or one in 1,000, it'll catch our attention. In the case of these ERCP-associated outbreaks, what we're seeing is attack rates that are often double digits. So in these examples that we have on the screen here, we're seeing that between 12 and 37 percent of the patients exposed to that dirty scope actually got infected. And in epidemiology, that's an extremely high attack rate. Now, the numbers are compelling. Absolutely, and should have all of our attention. Um, but I want to take it a little bit more personal than that by showing you an example of an outbreak that uh, occurred in a Texas institution. And actually, this institution uh, reported the outbreaks that occurred there in 2019 after they'd had two outbreaks. So the first outbreak happened in a, a time span from 2013 to 2016. And during that period of time, 20 patients were infected with uh, drug-resistant organisms that were linked to dirty ERCP scopes. And unfortunately, one of those patients died. Now, this only came to light because they had a continuing problem with ERCP scope-associated um, infections in 2018, when 12 more patients were infected with actually three different superbugs. And one of those patients unfortunately died uh, after testing positive for both CRE and uh, resistant E. coli following ERCP. Now again, these numbers are sobering. We've got more than 30 patients at this institution uh, who are sick, but I wanna tell you a little bit more about this particular patient. Now this person came in with abdominal pain uh, and it was found to be a stone in the common bile duct. And so they were treated with ERCP and a cholecystectomy. So they went and they took the gallbladder out. Now, unfortunately, this patient got pancreatitis and cholangitis shortly after the procedures, and, uh, and then it developed into sepsis. And even though they consulted all kinds of specialists, the sepsis progressed, and the patient became hypotensive. Without enough blood flow to the limbs, they actually had tissue necrosis in their limbs, and the doctors were forced to actually amputate their fingers and toes in trying to stop uh, the problems. But ultimately, the patient experienced multiple organ failure and did pass. Now, when the manufacturer went on site to see what was going on there, they found all kinds of really egregious breaches that had been going on for quite some period of time. 
This involved things like not doing the pre-cleaning after the procedures were over um, and not having any kind of protocols to do something if the scope wasn't cleaned right away. In addition, they were skipping a bunch of steps and sometimes they were blaming this on not having enough equipment and supplies. And then they were taking the patient ready scopes and they were handling them with bare hands. So there are many breaches and in my view, these were infections and unfortunately deaths that could have been prevented. Now we've established that there are problems with this elevator and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that elevator mechanism is really tough to clean. But it's important for you to recognize that contamination and infections have been linked to all kinds of components other than just the elevator mechanism. So this little table here shows you that there's evidence of infections and contamination uh, in the duodenoscopes used for ERCP that have been linked to suction biopsy channels and ports, air water channels, distal ends, and other channels and surfaces. And this is with a whole bunch of different kinds of bugs, including GI bugs and waterborne pathogens that we commonly find in scopes when they haven't been reprocessed effectively or when they're not dried before storage. Now, we've just established that it's not just the elevator, though the elevator is tough, and it's not just these other components of ERCP. It's actually problems or processing all kinds of scopes. And on this slide, I'm just giving you a little taste of the uh, kinds of problems we're seeing with other scopes. So um, a couple of years ago, there was an outbreak in London associated with contaminated ureteroscopes, and that involved 14 patients. There was a recent outbreak uh, involving cystoscopes in Ontario where eight patients got salmonella infections. And there was an outbreak in Pennsylvania involving 19 patients who got two different pathogens um, in uh, bronchoscopy procedures. And we've also seen outbreaks associated with colonoscopes, including a recent one uh, reported in Ontario involving three patients. So we know that we have problems with all kinds of scopes and it's not just the elevator. Now, there are a number of things that we can do to prevent these kinds of issues and reprocessing to prepare the scopes for safe uh, use in subsequent patients involves several big buckets of steps. Now, one of those things that absolutely must be done every time, oh, Hudson, we're, we're back to having it leap ahead of me and I'm not sure uh, about that, but I'll see if I can talk super fast. Uh, <laughs> so the, um, the main steps are the point of use pre-cleaning, manual cleaning that should involve uh, brushing and flushing the scope uh, very meticulously. That would be followed by HLD or sterilization and then uh, secure dry storage to keep pathogens that might still be uh, present from growing. Now, in order to make sure that that all is effective, we have a number of what we call pillars of quality assurance or uh, QA checks. And these include visual inspection with lighted magnification that should actually be done at multiple steps in the process. And now I wanna go forward and it doesn't want to, so let's see. There we go. Um, after it is delivered to the processing room, there should be a leak test to see if the channels are completely uh, uh, intact. And then after manual cleaning, there should be a biochemical test that verifies that cleaning was effective. Now, depending on whether you're doing HLD or sterilization, there should be an MEC test or a chemical and biological indicator if it's being sterilized to make sure that those strong chemicals are strong enough in order to kill everything. And then we should do something to make sure the scopes are actually dry before uh, they're stored. Now, the problem with this whole scheme is that it's very rarely or perhaps never actually done correctly. And this uh, table shows what we found during recent studies where we went to six different hospitals in the US. Uh, for four of them, we were doing studies on GI scopes and bronchoscopes. And for two of the hospitals, we were doing study on ureteroscopes. Now you can see here that hospital one and hospital six did most of the steps correctly, but they missed a couple of the steps that are absolutely essential to the whole thing working out well. In the other sites, they skipped most steps or did them incorrectly. 
even while we're there watching with a clipboard in hand. So kind of a best case scenario. Now, many physicians ask us if techs are skipping steps like this all the time, does it really matter if we do all the steps? And the bottom line is they didn't really get away with it. Uh, because as you can see here on the bottom of the side, in the sites doing uh, GI and bronchoscope studies, we found bacteria or mold in more than 50% of the scopes that were considered patient ready at every single site. And the sites doing uh, the ureteroscope study, they were sterilizing their scopes with hydrogen peroxide gas, and we found microbial growth between 8% and 25% of the time. So something is broken with this process because clearly it's not working even in sites that volunteer to be involved in studies. Now we're gonna jump into a case study that was done more recently than these other studies. And, uh, and Hudson, do you wanna jump in on this? Sure, sure. So I, I think, you know, one of the things that we wanted to talk about tonight was a couple different real life examples that would bring some of this material to light. So in this example, a head gastroenterologist actually requested a consult um, with Corey specifically, and then they identified that there was microbial growth that was found. And I think the key here is patient ready scopes during routine surveillance. So Corey, can you walk us through exactly what your team found? Yeah, so uh, we were requested to come to this site and uh, I went on site and did a brief audit and it was astonishing because when I walked in the decontamination room where the dirty scopes go for the manual cleaning, uh, I walked in and, and it was empty. There was nothing there. There were no uh, dis or detergents, there were no brushes, there were no irrigation pumps, no uh, equipment for visual inspection. And I said, you know, what's going on here? You've got nothing over here to clean the scopes. And they said that they'd had some problems with the irrigation pumps and, and the other equipment used for cleaning and the joint commission was coming and they knew that they might notice it. So they took it out. Uh, and they admitted that they hadn't actually been doing any manual cleaning or any visual inspection for months. And in fact, they'd stopped doing cleaning verification tests that they previously had in place because they always failed. Because of course, they weren't actually irrigating the scopes or, or doing any cleaning. And what they were doing is uh, they would deliver the scopes to this decontamination room, pass them through the window, and then put it in the AER without any cleaning or visual inspection. So I asked if I could take a look at the scopes and went and uh, looked at the scopes in their cabinets. So these are patient ready scopes. And from several feet away, I could see that every single scope in their entire fleet was badly damaged or had visible debris and dirt on it. Now that becomes a bad day for everybody, right? I mean, that you can't get around that. So the head gastroenterologist convened a panel of IPs and risk people and executives, and we had to share with them the really tough story that the scopes are all uh, dirty and damaged and probably actually hundreds or thousands of patients uh, were exposed before this came to light. Uh, unfortunately, late in the game because the surveillance cultures confirmed that they had pathogens or potential pathogens on patient ready scopes. So uh, let's uh, move on to a second case study. And Hudson, do you want to cue up this one? Sure. So this was, you know, by no surprise, a site that participated in the study, but they had massive reprocessing breaches. So we're, again, going back to the different elements of the process um, and realizing that there were several breaches. And in this particular one, they actually found two different um, main species of microbial uh, contamination within the cultures. And again, going back to Corey's point, there's variability in culturing as well. So Corey, do you want to walk us through what the team found with this one? Yeah, well, this caught our attention uh, because the microbial cultures, it was actually colonies in, and we call it TNTC, which is too numerous to count. So the, the culture plates just grew out like crazy. And uh, we looked at our cleaning verification data and actually the scope that had the worst amount of residual soil on it in the whole study, and this study involved all kinds of scopes, colonoscopes, gastroscopes, uh, and urology scopes uh, in Bronx, as well as ERCP. The highest ATP level showing that there's organic soil was on the distal end of an ERCP scope. And uh, we also found in that particular scope that there was a visible fluid that we could see with a boroscope when we looked inside it. And also when we used a chemical indicator to see if there was residual uh, fluid, it detected moisture inside the scope. Now, when we looked at the scope with lighted magnification, 
we also could see that there was damage and there was a thick white fluid under the elevator. Now we could see it uh, with a magnifying glass, but we wanted to see if we could capture it because we wanted to send it out for tests and find out what it was. And so this next slide shows us actually using a boroscope and, and little swabs trying to capture that. And so a couple of my team members are peering over the uh, image on the, on the boroscope video, and we're looking um, with 17 times magnification at the elevator mechanism. And you can see the little blob of white stuff uh, in the elevator there. Now, that looked suspicious to me for being cimethicone because it looked identical to it, but I wanted to capture it and send it to a lab to do FTIR testing on it and see if it was indeed cimethicone. But we couldn't get it out with any of the swabs or brushes we had, so we asked the site to get uh, whatever they had that was smaller. And even with a one millimeter brush, we couldn't get up under the elevator to get that blob of white stuff out, which tells me that you can't get up under the elevator to get a blob of stuff out. And if we can't get it out when we're doing research and taking all the time in the world to try to get it out, then uh, the manual cleaning process by the techs in the routine basis is not going to be able to get soil or residual semethicone or anything else out from underneath that scope. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times doing inspection with lighted magnification. I just wanted to show you a couple of photos that I took uh, to show you duodenoscopes with damage. On the left is a biopsy port area that's badly scratched, and that non-intact surface can harbor uh, soil and bio burden. On the right, you can see the adhesive band that joins the bending section to the insertion tube uh, is actually uh, gone brittle and chunks of it had come off, uh, which can uh, tear patient tissue. And also uh, it tears the gloves of the techs, which uh, could actually cut them as well and expose them to uh, hazardous infectious material. And then the one in the middle is a boroscope shot of something in the channel. We don't know if that's a shredded channel or actually tissue or something remaining in there. Now, the last picture I'm going to show you actually was given to me by someone I met at a conference uh, who said, hey, if you're interested in ERCP scopes, we know it doesn't get clean up under the elevator because we made a really bad mistake at our site. Uh, one of the techs actually put a scope in the ETO machine for sterilization and forgot to put the ETO uh, vent on. So the pressure became high and it exploded. And here is what uh, they saw when they looked at the scope that was exploded. Uh, obviously, the adhesive bands blew off, but you can see up under the elevator, there is all this brownish, rusty, orange glop. And uh, they believe, and I think it's true, that that is biologic in origin. Uh, and it's stuff up under the elevator that simply didn't get removed during their process of uh, manual cleaning and reprocessing for that scope. So my concerns about uh, what's going on in the field and their ability to get these scopes clean uh, really keeps being reinforced by all of these data. And I think now we're going to turn it back to Hudson, uh, and I'd like you to talk about uh, this case study, which uh, Hudson was involved in this uh, in a facility that actually had been doing about 30 ERCPs a week using 14 duodenoscopes. And they had multiple readmissions due to, to infections within 30 days following procedures. And I'd love you to unpack that a little bit for us. Sure. So, you know, in this particular instance, this is an example of where a couple different things went off the rails. Uh, first and foremost was the training records for the staff were simply not present. And this is a common occurrence when we look for sort of competency documentation. The infection preventionists also were very worried, but quite frankly, not as knowledgeable as they could be about what was taking place in this particular unit. And so this goes back to a lot of what Corey talked about earlier to make sure that every step of the process is properly monitored. And so an audit was then conducted and essentially they looked at gross contamination, right? And that gross contamination could be visible bio burden or soil, it could be microbial in nature. Um, but we also know that there's serious maintenance issues that might be present there. So this combined with a lack of proper training, uh, they're not doing a lot of environmental monitoring, that creates a lot of risk, right? And anytime you're using a reusable device, there's not just the risk of the device that is yours, but there's also that potential risk that you have with loaner devices that might float through the facility throughout the year. And so it's important to have those included in your normal process. Um, in this particular instance, 
This is one where the CDC uh, was involved in this at the state's request, and this particular facility, they shut it down temporarily in order to get a handle of what was actually going on. And so this brings to light, right, how do we sort of monitor for this stuff proactively? How do we make sure that we're doing that good visual inspection? How do we ensure that we're doing some type of auditing of the staff, but also the other equipment that are present? And a lot of people have moved to either ATP or channel check or even culturing, and each of these has sort of an advantage and a, a disadvantage that you have to think carefully through. But visual inspection is one that is frequently missed on a routine basis. So from that, the FDA commissioned a post-market surveillance study um, that's called the 522 study. And essentially it looked at two basic things. One was they wanted to look at, and this was specific to duodenoscopes, by the way, for ERCPs. But the first goal was to sort of look at this from a human factor standpoint, right? What factors with the personnel, because we know there's variability in training, there's variability in the equipment that they have. Certainly the room designs are very different. Um, and so they wanted to sort of understand the human factor element of reprocessing. And really the second piece to this was they wanted to look at what's the microbial contamination on, on properly reprocessed devices. And so the sites that were selected were from all three of the uh, major um, duodenoscope manufacturers. And so this data is not specific to one. And really the concern is not specific to one. It's really uh, specific to the whole industry as it relates to reprocessing of these devices. And FDA um, really wanted to understand what could they do as a regulatory body to you know, positively impact reprocessing failures. And of course, there's only so much FDA can do. There's only so much an individual facility could do. So this was really a collaborative effort between the endoscope manufacturers, regulatory agencies, as well as healthcare facilities. So let's look at the timeline of this. So back in October of 2015, the studies were ordered, right? So these were not voluntary activities. These were studies that were ordered to all three of the major manufacturers. And in March of 2018, due to a multitude of different issues, there were warning letters that were issued for non-compliance, right? One of the initial concerns from personal experience was healthcare facilities didn't want to participate. This was a big risk liability, and so it was very difficult to get facilities um, to actually want to engage in this process because of the fear of exposing uh, risk with the process. So in December of 2018, the interim results themselves were released from the FDA, which led to a lot of conversations with the regulatory agencies as well as the CDC. Um, as a matter of fact, before the CDC actually made some of their additional recommendations, they requested a presentation from the FDA to the Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee. And part of that input was really looking at much of what Corey's presented, but also to say from a larger public health context, what do we need to do as a regulatory agency from the FDA perspective and as a clinical organization such as the CDC that publishes evidence-based guidelines? And so there was a recommendation that was made to shift to either sterilization or single-use devices. Right, and I think Corey's, uh, I think next to last slide showing a sterilized device still having contamination, it really speaks to some of the root issues there. And in 2020, we've seen some of those updated results released um, from these post-market surveillance studies. So just from a human factor standpoint, uh, Corey and I were sort of joking in preparing this program and I thought, you know, we're thinking how many steps could we follow on a daily basis every single time and do it 100% correct. And I think we were joking and said probably no more than 10. And yet when we look at some of the examples here, you may have 8, 12, 21 different steps and there's variability for the reprocessing personnel by model. So you very well may have five, six, seven, eight models of endoscopes that you're responsible for reprocessing. And unless you have some type of visual aid that is not only showing you the correct steps, but also monitoring that process, you have a lot of potential for risk and, and specifically contamination. We also know that pre-cleaning adherence is low, right? And so when we look at the overall amount of times people do things correctly, versus incorrectly, we have a disproportion here that's not in a positive light, right? And I wanna be very clear that we're not blaming the personnel, right? This is a systems related issue. It's not just the FDA, it's not just the endoscope manufacturers, it's not just the personnel, but it's really the entire system has to be redesigned in order to ensure that we have a consistent patient safe outcome every single time that these procedures are performed. 
Um, as it relates to manual cleaning, this is really complex, right? But we know that manual cleaning is one of the absolute most important pieces of this reprocessing of reusable devices. And so if we look at the Olympus um, PJF160 as an example, you've got 111 steps there. There's no way that a person can do that reliably, quickly, and responsibly every single time, especially with the variability between the different models. So one of the things that both CDC and FDA came out with as a recommendation was to try to standardize. So that if you look at a particular manufacturer, whether it's Olympus, Fuji, or Pentax, that you could actually have consistency across the different types of scopes so that the reprocessing technicians could memorize those steps and it would be a lot less complex. But again, that requires a lot of redesign from that standpoint. And so it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look on the, the first graph on the left, there is a green part at the very bottom of this that shows that that manual cleaning adherence is pretty non-existent in that example, right? And again, if we don't have proper manual cleaning, we don't have removal of soil or bio burden, and we potentially have the ability to have adherence of a biofilm, right? And once that biofilm is actually imparted into the device, you're not gonna get rid of it, right? Really the only way to get rid of that is to actually swap out the components of that device and physically throw that biofilm away, right? And so when we look at the data, specifically for the TJF, um, the Q180V, right? Out of those 73 critical steps, 45 were not uh, successfully performed by 27% or more of the participants, right? And anything above zero, especially as it relates to cleaning, creates a risk for the user as well as the patient, as well as the health system, right? So I did wanna dive a little bit deeper to make sure we're all on the same page as it relates to how these organisms were classified, right? And there's a little bit of variability in this due to interpretation by each of the participants in the study, but a high concern pathogen, right, or organism was one that we would associate with human disease, right? So these are the true pathogens of concern, like your CREs and, and your Klebsiella's and your Pseudomonas and things like that, right? So these are things that would cause disease in human populations especially those that were immunocompromised. And then there was another classification of what they refer to as low or moderate concern, right? And these are organisms that not normally would cause human infections that would be problematic, but they also would be suggestive of both reprocessing failures and environmental contamination. And one of the things that's been learned by the FDA through this process is that even if we're doing cultures, there's a lot of variability in the collection technique. There's a lot of variability in the interpretation of the results and even sort of the laboratory analysis. And so the FDA, of course, was thinking that these devices would be completely clean and we wouldn't have any high concern pathogens, right? And so what they were looking for was sort of two things, either the growth of a high concern pathogen, which of course was bad, or more than 100 CFUs of low or moderate concern organisms, right? And this also varied by the different international guidelines that were out there. And so if we look at the total number of samples that were collected versus analyzed, you will notice that there's sort of a disparity here. And part of that was that at least with two of the manufacturers, um, the FDA reports indicated that there was a sample protocol breach. And so some of those samples had to be redone um, and were not properly collected. And so when we look at the total number of samples that was driven by the FDA based on the market share and the number of devices that were out there. But really the most important part of this is sort of the purplish part, which is included in the final results, right? So this is what the FDA used to analyze. And you'll see with Fujifilm that there was not enough data is to really be reported as in the interim data that was shown. So the FDA had this sort of general expectation that was decided amongst the FDA in consultation with other organizations such as the CDC and the American Society for Microbiology to have sort of a contamination rate of less than 0.4%. But you can see here with the final analysis that was published on the FDA's website that that was not exactly what they found. Right? And so for high concern pathogens, you saw rates from 1.9 all the way up to 5%. And for your low um, concern or moderate concern organisms, anywhere from 0.6% up to 4.4%. Right? Again, this is not a rate of infection, but this is a rate of contamination. And so if we have a contaminated device that enters, for example, an immunocompromised patient, 
then we know that that risk exponentially goes up for the development of a healthcare associated infection that is linked back to the device. And it's not just the risk to that one patient, but it's specifically the risk to all of the subsequent patients that might come beyond um, that particular thing. So these are direct quotes from the FDA's uh, publication, and, and it really speaks to sort of the volume of the issue. The most recent studies from Fujifilm, Olympus, and Pentax continue to show elevated rates of contamination, including the presence of high concern organisms, right? Again, the FDA's expectation was less than 0.4%. I don't know how they came up with that exact number, um, but it certainly was not what they expected to see. And the second quote, which really gets to sort of the process and the personnel is the results suggest that users frequently had difficulty understanding and following the manufacturer's reprocessing instruction for use, and as a result, were not able to successfully complete reprocessing, right? So this gets back to that human factors element of people will make mistakes and we can't automate every single part of this process. So the FDA said, well, what do we do next, right? What are some of the additional insights that we have? Well, one of the first things was redesigning the reprocessing instruction manual, right? And there were several manufacturers that did an outstanding job of this to try to bring to light, how do we simplify this process? How do we make it easier for users to be able to do that? But you know, really recommend that we sort of put some parameters around this as far as competency. Right now, every single time that these studies were conducted, a lot of the input from the technicians came to say, I'm being rushed to get these devices back out in, into clinical practice because we don't have enough devices. And so that creates sort of an inventory issue. The second thing that came up, and I had the opportunity to participate in a two-day meeting about this, was really looking at third-party repair. Right? So even the reusable devices, they may be designed and maintained, but if for whatever reason the healthcare facility elected to use a non-OEM sort of service model, there was that potential for adulteration of the device, right? non-validated parts, maybe those personnel were not properly trained on inspection, and certainly the quality may not be the same. The same was true for things like cleaning brushes, where, for example, you may see toothbrushes being used to clean elevators. You may see damage that's being used. You certainly can have other types of accessories that might get stuck in there or may not properly remove the debris fully. And one of the last things the FDA discussed in the meetings was really looking at materially incompatible detergents and disinfectants, right? Because if we don't flush all this stuff out, there can be patient harm. There's been cases, for example, where alcohol was flushed um, to actually dry the scope, but it never got completely sort of expunged from the device. And then you have colitis um, due to patient issues and contacts with that. We also know that alcohol is a fixative, and so it's going to fix things within the devices and could potentially cause residue. So we know that there's those issues, right? And then we have sort of the other ancillary tools and resources that are used to reprocess devices like the AER. Has that been properly validated? Is it being monitored? For example, there was an incident reported to the FDA where the AER did not have any high level disinfectant in it, right? It had simply run out and no one was checking that. And so those, those samples, obviously when they were tested failed. There's certainly issues with contamination with storage, right? Or even handling the devices. So if you've got a device that's been properly high level disinfected and it's in a storage cabinet, then you really don't wanna go touch that with your bare hands, for example. The same is true if you're doing a sterilization process. And you've got the storage cabinets. And one of the things that I really sort of got irked by was I could walk into units and smell mold um, because you would find water dripping from scopes in a lot of places. And so it's important to make sure that the devices are not just reprocessed correctly, but they have to be handled and stored correctly as well. And we all are aware of the issues with personnel turnover, right? And the training, right? I can train you to your blue in the face, but if you're not competent, it was really training that was completely wasted. And so it's gotta be role specific, whether if you're the nurse at the bedside and you're doing that initial bedside pre-clean, that's very different than if you're actually gonna reprocess the scopes in the reprocessing room. Another thing that Corey and I've talked about pretty extensively is that it also could be users that are doing reprocessing that have never been trained. So for example, if you're on call for a weekend and you're a resident physician or a fellow, you may be delegated to actually do that scope reprocessing because there's no one there. And so having the right people available to reprocess or using a disposable device will really ensure that you're mitigating that risk. 
And lastly, even with the FDA's own validated protocol for microbial culturing, there's issues with this, right? It requires a minimum of two people. There's potential for environmental contamination. You ideally should not be using a hospital lab because they're not equipped to actually look for environmental samples. And it's certainly a very costly episode of things that you have to do. And there, like I said, can be wide interpretation of those, those results. So the post-market design changes that were really uh, mandated by FDA don't really look specifically at the impact to ability or the ability, excuse me, to properly clean and disinfect the device. And so this all goes back to reprocessing instructions for use, device design, sort of that accountability of personnel and some type of monitoring there. Right. And there's also things that can take place between manufacturers of the endoscopes, as well as other devices that are used like the AERs, some of the instruments that might be passed through the device. And so there can be sort of a disconnect there as well. We talked a little bit about that third party servicing and accessories that are not validated by the OEM manufacturer. So the OEM manufacturer provides that device in that exact state and they know how it works. But if it's not going to be serviced by them, there's all these variabilities that can take place that can cause issue. And one of the last things that's been well identified in the CDC guideline is that there's a generalized lack of a standardization process for purchasing, right? So the evaluation of a medical device really needs to be done according to a set um, thing of parameters that will help us make sure we're making evidence-based decisions. Right, and so these identified hospital reprocessing challenges should be no surprise to us. Things like environmental contamination, the use of an AER that's not properly uh, reprocessed, reprocessing. You've also got things like environmental temperatures and humidity that can totally change. You know, when you walk into a reprocessing room and the humidity is 100%, you're gonna have potential issues there. And so from this, the FDA took all of this data from the 522 studies, had uh, pretty open conversations with the industry as well as other clinical stakeholders like APIC and CDC, and came out with a, a safety alert that really recommends that manufacturers and healthcare facilities begin transitioning to doing this duodenoscopes with disposable components to reduce the risk of patient infection, right? And so we've got two choices in life. We can either be proactive or reactive in our approach. And so specifically what FDA was trying to do is say, let's be proactive and prevent those dangerous pathogens, those high concern pathogens from ever getting in the device and subsequently the patient. Right, and that requires not only work with the devices, but also the personnel and the surrounding environment, whether it's the GI suite, um, the reprocessing room, or the storage um, areas of these devices. And a lot of healthcare facilities have said, we can't take this anymore. We're gonna sort of do a central sterile processing model. And while there can be some advantages to that, it did not eliminate all of the risks that have been identified in the 522 study. So the CDC's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee did publish a fairly lengthy document that is extremely comprehensive to help guide healthcare facilities in making good, solid evidence-based decisions about reprocessing for flexible endoscopes. And as Corey mentioned, what we're talking about tonight has been really centered around ERCP as a procedure, but all of these elements can be widely applied to other reusable flexible endoscopes. Basic things like an audit tool and very, very verifying competency of our personnel, really looking at our gap analysis to say, where are we compared to the evidence-based standards? And what are some of our potential gaps internally that we need to address? And so the medical device itself has a lot of variability, but then at individual facilities, it may be different people that are involved. The equipment may be different. The sort of completeness of how they were trained may be completely different, right? They may not have ready access to the manufacturer's instructions for use. Um, I don't think I could reliably do 20 steps if I had five different models, right? Because that's multiple, that's hundreds of steps that I have to really remember um, to ensure that I'm actually competent in that particular process. So some of the things that the FDA identified, and I'm gonna focus in on a couple of them, were areas, for example, where debris could be caught. And I think Corey showed that beautiful picture underneath that elevator when it exploded, that you've got debris that if you can't see it, you can't remove it, right? And even it's not related just to the elevator, but also some of the other accessories and componentry that are in the device. And some of the device designs don't allow us to get there, right? Even with magnified um, sort of visualization of the devices, maybe we can see it, maybe we can't, but we actually can't remove it. And even the use of bore scopes are not foolproof. 
And so it's, it's almost sort of like if you're using a borescope, it's similar to if you teach somebody how to reach a, uh, read a text x-ray and they don't have that sort of background knowledge, you've got to know what the image is that you're even looking at. And so there was a great study that was done back in 2008, really looking at the overall microbial load of these endoscopes. And so if, let's just sort of take a baseline of a GI endoscope contains, let's just call it 10 to the 7. That cleaning, if we're on the good end, is going to get you sort of a, you know, a two log reduction on the better end, a six log reduction. And then your high level disinfection, let's just go on the low end, is going to give you a four log reduction. Right. So your variability of total reduction from baseline is anywhere from six logs to 12 logs. Right. And that is a large amount of variability. So if one part specifically cleaning is not done properly, we have a big area, area of risk because we have no margin of error. Right. And we know that biofilms can also contribute to transmission as well. <clears throat> so, Corey, do you want to set up this case study for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I know you got involved with this situation in a, a facility that does ERCPs three days a week, and they had a really high turnover in reprocessing staff with the average tech lasting only six months. So they're really cycling through their staff. And those um, personnel were trained by what they called a master trainer, um, where they only basically read the IFU and they didn't actually observe them uh, doing reprocessing competency. And as, as you've mentioned and I've mentioned, there are 237 steps to reprocess and it takes 46 minutes to do all these things. So without good training, uh, it's not gonna go well, but I, I believe uh, you could tell us more about the IP and kind of what happened at that site. Sure, so this was actually in the last month that I had this conversation with a facility that had asked for some help. And the infection preventionist sort of got alerted um, due to some issues that they were having in the perioperative space, and then sort of unearthed the fact that these people were all being trained by one person internally, and the last time that person was trained by the manufacturer was almost eight years ago, right? And so this can create some massive risk. Um, you know, and part of this is how do we control the risk with the device, but also how do we control the risk with how people are trained, and especially with the train, the, the sort of turnover that takes place with this, it can, you know, create an issue. The other thing that came from this particular case study, when I asked the infection preventionist and the GI nursing manager some questions, they were only tracking procedure time and anesthesia time. There was no tracking of reprocessing time. And so in sort of their clinical block scheduling, they were not building in the time necessary for that device to be properly maintained so that it can come back into use. Um, and so they actually ended up stopping some procedures, which worked out well because this was going on during COVID, um, to allow for some intensive training with teachbacks. And those teachbacks are extremely important to make sure that you've got good demonstration of competency. But again, just like with something like CPR, we know that we lose that competency every 90 days if we don't maintain it. And so the same is true here. And so this facility elected to do weekly bacterial culturing for at least six months um, to do some monitoring of their current situation. So risk recognition though, is not just for the clinicians, right? It also goes, goes back to like materials management, purchasing, our colleagues in biomedical engineering, environmental services play a role here, as well as facilities that are fortunate enough to have a human factors engineer on staff. And so when we look at some of the wish list, if you will, um, specific to the FDA, things like smooth surfaces, maybe the device shouldn't be black as an example, so you could see into it, right? Ensuring that you have good identification of risk um, and that you can actually get disposable components for those hard to clean areas, like the elevators or the channels, or have a way that's gonna in, in sort of ensure that all of the uh, debris can be properly removed from the device. Right. And so the FDA went a little bit further and they said the FDA believes the best solution to reducing the risk of disease transmission by duodenoscopes is through innovative device designs that make reprocessing easier, more effective or completely unnecessary. And so they went further and said hospitals and endoscopy facilities should transition to innovative designs that include disposable components such as disposable end caps or to a fully disposable duodenoscope when they become available. And so this was a big shift for the FDA, as well as the manufacturers of devices to say, it's not good enough just to improve reprocessing. And yes, sort of a step gap in the middle and sort of that bridge point was to have disposable components, but ideally we wanna make reprocessing completely unnecessary, not just for the sake of the device, but also for the sake of the personnel that are gonna to have to be responsible for that process. 
And so the Institute for Medicine really looks at six basic things as it relates to quality and patient safety, right? And I think we can apply this to this category of the ERCP procedure and say, are, is what we're doing safe? right? Is it timely? Is it going to allow access of care? Is it going to be effective, right? Is our process efficient? Because if we can get rid of that hour reprocessing time, as an example, and we can refocus those personnel, maybe at bedside care or interacting with patients where they're better served, that's a huge win. And is it equitable and patient-centered, right? If I'm a patient and I have an option between a disposable device and a non-disposable device, I want the disposable device because I know that there's not going to be that risk, right? Now, I can't control as a healthcare facility what the patient brings to the table, right? What is their endogenous floor that they bring to the equation? I have zero control over that. And in most cases, unless I'm culturing for some other reason, I don't even know what they're bringing to the table at the first place. So, Corey, why don't you set us up for this next study? Yes, yeah, so this was a situation where a hospital is considering a renewal of their reusable duodenoscope fleet because they'd been using them for about 10 years. And they hadn't been routinely inspected on site or by the manufacturer, except when they were sent out for maintenance. So tell us more about that, Hudson. Right. So this was an instance where you've got sort of that longevity um, issue with the device itself, right? You've got the lack of that on-site inspection, because remember, until just recently with the FDA safety alerts, due to endoscopes did not have, in most cases, a scheduled maintenance, right? And so now new devices have to be serviced at least once a year by the manufacturer. And so you've got issues where, in this instance, the endoscopes were all failing ATP, which is one issue, right? And the quarterly culturing, however, was always sent to their lab. So it was actually going to the hospital's internal laboratory, which frankly did not have the capability of actually determining the presence of these pathogens. So they really needed to be working with an environmental lab that had the expertise in order to recover this, right? So when we think about this from both a clinical and an operational standpoint, I've got to determine what's my total cost of ownership of these devices from start to finish, right? From the time that I service them, maintain them, get loaners, store them, reprocess them, uh, service them as needed, um, and, and also train my staff, right? We were only doing ATP testing to really find the failures, but the quarterly culturing was really revealing nothing. So that tells us that there were issues there as well. And then lastly, when we look at sustainable patient safety, I've got to get to a point of reliability with my process where I feel like what I'm doing is going to be extremely effective. And so the way that we can solve this is to really put the patient in the center of every single activity that we do, right? And this is really where the FDA and the CDC play a big role because they really service the patient. You know, if you look at the sort of vision and mission of the FDA is to protect the public health of the United States, right? And so the patient is at the center of that. And so it really requires collaboration from facilities to accreditation bodies like the Joint Commission, certainly our regulatory partners like the FDA, um, and then also all of the other ancillary things like the third party uh, repair organizations and reprocessing organizations that exist out there. So when we look at all of this in sort of summation, we know that there are issues not just with the RCPs, but really with all reusable flexible endoscopes. And the data that was presented tonight, especially from Corey, is not just looking at articles. It's really also looking at the MAUD reports, as well as the FDA's own publicly published post-market surveillance studies. And this tells us that there's risk with devices, there's issues with the process, and there's also issues with the monitoring and sort of the reporting. The other thing that was really not discussed tonight is the global implications of this work because we know that there are different regulatory reporting systems across the globe that might or might not be capturing some of this information. The use of a re reusable device itself can create risk, right? Because it requires us to have some type of reliable, quality-oriented system that is really going to be centered around universal surveillance. And we can't economically culture every device. We also know that culturing alone is not 100% foolproof, right? And when we combine that with our human factors data that we know, where there's risk associated with human error in this equation, as well as the environmental challenges, because we know that most of the reprocessing rooms need a lot of work, right? Because they're not designed to actually produce the outcome of the system that we're trying to achieve. And so that has negative consequences on the overall effectiveness of reprocessing. And then lastly, the regulatory organizations, most notably FDA, 
have told us to start transitioning to devices that are either totally disposable or those with disposable components. And if we go back to sort of the diagram that Corey popped up, we know that there are lots of unseen risk that cannot be seen with the naked human eye that require us to think very carefully about what's best for our patients. And as we sort of summarize this evening, every single thing is incremental right it's always the conversation about what is best for our patients what is going to make the most sense for our clinicians and how do we operationalize that from start to finish with sort of the purchasing process implementation and an evaluation of our process to ensure that the safety of the patients is always at the very very beginning of what we do and so we provided some additional references for you. The slides will be available in a handout format uh, following this evening's presentation as well. Um, I did want to reiterate before we open it up for question and answer that if you are a nurse and you're looking for your CE credits, those evaluations will be emailed to you within five business days and you have 30 days from the time that that's sent out to complete your uh, CE evaluation um, and receive your certificate. Once you complete the evaluation online, there'll be a bu button at the top that says generate certificate and you'll be able to download your PDF certificate instantaneously. If you're another type of healthcare professional that's beyond nursing, feel free to let us know and we'll make available a generic certificate of completion for your own professional development um, needs. So with that, um, I'm gonna see if we've got any questions that have come up here. It looks like we have several that have come in, so give me just a moment here. So Corey, it looks like the first question um, actually has uh, come up for you. And it, it's really looking at some of the data that you presented and what do you think are the biggest gaps related to reprocessing of reusable duty in the scopes and can they ever been truly resolved? Like, is it even possible? Oh boy, you know, I, I don't know if it can be resolved, but I'll tell you that the complex uh, instructions for use are a huge issue. Um, and as you and I have both mentioned, there's just dozens or hundreds of, of steps that these texts are supposed to to memorize for all the different models. And I think it's just uh, uh, too much basically. Um, but that is exacerbated by the fact that these instruments are extremely difficult to clean. You can't see what you're doing when you're cleaning the inside of something that's opaque. And I'm not absolutely convinced that they're, um, that they're durable instruments because 100% uh, of the scopes we inspect with lighted magnification or boroscopes, 100% of them have damage. And the question is, how long can they be used or how many uses before they're damaged in a way that allows that soil and, and bio burden to be on there and not come off? So um, I, I will say that I think uh, it, it boils down to the mix of the, uh, the device or the product and uh, those instructions and human factors. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, I'll, I'll tackle this one, I think, and it's, do you think that the FDA and CDC have taken enough action to actually improve the ERCP procedures? And I'll let Corey chime in at the end if she'd like to, but, you know, I, I think in general, it's well beyond the context of just those two agencies, right? FDA simply regulates those devices, but they don't control how they're medically used in the clinical practice environment. So as far as sort of their scope of, of influence, it's, it's really with the regulatory piece. And then they certainly will look at MAUD reports and some of the information that Corey reported. And so I'd sort of reframe that question and say, have we as an industry, as a profession, done enough? And I think the answer is no. Um, and that really requires the collaboration of the endoscope manufacturers, the FDA, certainly the CDC yeah. Joint Commission is involved in this, as well as the clinicians. And we also have to be af not afraid to come to a table together and say, we have an issue, here are our ideas to fix it, and let's make sure we sort of do trial runs to test the sort of impetus of change to figure out what works. Because even if we move completely to disposable, we also have to ensure that those devices are also properly used, right? And so anytime a user does not follow the manufacturer's instructions for use, we have risk. And so that is something that really falls back onto that human factor step. Mm -hmm. Corey, anything you'd like to add to that? I would just uh, say yes, ditto that. Perfect. Um, it looks like the next question that came in is, do you believe that there will be some type of mandatory tracking for infection in the future? For example, will CDC make this mandatory to track in information on device-related infections? And so that's a, a good question. So if you're a hospital, your infection preventionist already participates 
in reporting actually for device related infections through the National Healthcare Safety Network, right? That is a public reporting system that is tracked through the CDC. One of the elements of that is what type of procedure was performed. And so the IP can actually report in there um, specific information related to ERCPs, what organisms were found, but that also gets reported to the FDA if it's a device related event. And so it goes back to what Corey was talking about. There's sort of the MOD reports, which look at a device related adverse event matched up with the CDC data um, that help us sort of understand that public health impact. So I, I don't know if, if, you know, CDC is going to mandate something specific to endoscopes, um, but they are always looking at what are sort of those broader risks that they need to take action on. So Corey, anything you'd like to add from the epidemiology standpoint? I, no, other than that, we rely again on the human factors of how busy are the IPs and, and even if there is a, a reporting repository, do they have the time and initiative to do that? And again, we need all the stakeholders at the table if we're going to solve this collaboratively. Perfect. Uh, Corey, it looks like we have a question that came in for you regarding the comment that you made about culturing. And the question is, should all of the duodenoscopes actually get cultured after every single reprocessing cycle before mm -hmm. use on an additional patient? So what are your thoughts on that? I know you hit on this a little bit. It, you know, I, I actually, even though uh, we do cultures all the time, and I really love looking at the findings from that, I don't think it makes sense for the end users to be culturing every scope uh, before every procedure in part, because they, they might mislead themselves into thinking that everything's fine when it's not, because it's extremely tough to do a good job with sampling and processing of those uh, cultures. And uh, even if you do things pretty well, you might have false negatives because it's hard to grow out bugs that are thriving in a scope, but may not like uh, being tortured in the lab. And so um, those false negatives could lead people to think that there's not a risk. Uh, and the false positives from environmental contamination or handling issues uh, could also lead people down a path potentially of treating patients who don't need to be treated, et cetera. Um, but I think the other uh, thing about this really, Hudson, is that we um, should be doing something to make sure we're processing, if we're using reusable scopes, is effective before we're done. And so that's really right. about implementing those uh, quality pillars. So first of all, training everyone and making sure we've got uh, a processing center set up to do it right. But then doing all those things like the leak testing, visual inspection, um, cleaning verification tests, uh, MEC tests, et cetera, all along the way. And if we're not doing all of those quality assurance checks, every scope, every time, then we have no business uh, bothering with the cultures because it's just going to identify a problem like happened at the institution I talked about, where the, the head GI doc is like, hey, we have positive cultures. Well, we dial it backwards and there was nothing else that was being done right. We might as well fix all that first uh, rather than use cultures as kind of the, the final answer. I would agree. And it's almost like a tool bed approach, right? I think to, to what you talked about, that we have different tools that will help us identify risk. But one of the ones that we so frequently miss is visual inspection. Right, and so that visual inspection can identify so many issues. So it looks like the next question that just came in was what steps can we take to minimize the adverse environmental impacts if we use a disposable device? Um, and I think that's a, a tough one. Certainly if the device is recyclable, that's advantageous. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if the device can be you know, minimized as far as the waste stream. But I always go back to this. If you ask a risk manager in a healthcare facility do you want green or do you want something that's completely safe? They're never going to select green. So just sort of think about that, that context. Corey, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I would like to add something. Um, my team has done two studies on the cost associated with reusable scopes and, uh, and single-use scopes. And one of the things that we did was we actually collected the garbage that's generated by reprocessing a GI scope. And it is unbelievable. So if you think about what it takes to reprocess a scope, just even starting with the PPE that should be right. worn, gowns and gloves and, and uh, et cetera, but they're supposed to use disposable brushes and they're gonna right. use sponges or wipes and they're going to actually put detergent and high level disinfectant or sterilant uh, probably down the drain into the water supply. And so the environmental impact of reprocessing is astonishing 
when you actually look at what's generated from that, and just uh, in terms of the size of that, uh, the the uh, single-use scope is way, way, way less garbage than what's generated in reprocessing. And if, if you want to um, see photos, I don't know if we cited this in our reference list, but we published the findings of those studies in Isham's uh, journal Communique or Process, and uh, that's available for Isham members or if you contact us, we can send you a copy of that and you can actually see how much waste is generated by reprocessing. Good. And it looks like the last question that has come in is, and this is a good question um, from one of our SGNA participants, is will Amy ever publish the updated guideline? Um, Corey, do you want to address that since you sit on that committee? Yeah, so my understanding is that we'll be seeing another draft of the new AMI Standard 91 uh, in the coming weeks. There is uh, the AMI Standards Week is having meetings convened, I think the, the week of the 15th or something like that. I don't have my October date straight in my head, but it's in the next three weeks or so. Uh, so we'll be meeting on that again. I think the work group is hoping that the revisions to AMI Standard 91 will be completed this fall for release sometime uh, soon, shortly uh, thereafter, and it's a much stronger standard. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted with the progress that was made. When I think probably the short answer is uh, what we refer to now as PCT, pre-COVID pre time, right? Yeah. So pre-COVID time sort of caused a lot of delays. So unfortunately, that was probably one of them. Yep. Uh, so it looks like, Patrick, that's all the questions that Corey and I have in the queue over here. So I'd like to turn it back over to you to make any closing remarks from the team. No, I appreciate it. This was really informative, as always. Thanks for your two opinions and deep dive into the research. Um, that's all for today in terms of the presentation and the Q&A. Uh, I want to, want to thank all the participants uh, for joining and, and listening on this informative topic. A replay, a replay will be available on Endoscopy Now's app within a few days uh, if you'd like to revisit it for anything else. Um, with that, thanks again, and uh, everybody have a, a good evening and a good rest of your week. Thanks, Cheers. everyone, for joining us.